morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Welcome to First Lutheran Church once again, as we are at home, together, apart. Today is the third Sunday in the time of Lent. Today marks the last Sunday liturgically a year ago that we were together in the sanctuary. It has been a remarkable year, a year of triumph, of sadness and grief, a year of tragedy, and hopefully in the midst of all things, a year of faith, as we have been invited over and over again in ways that we probably, in ways that we surely did not imagine, to place our lives into God's care through the person of Jesus. I'm ever so grateful to be able to join with you even in this way. It would be have been tremendously tragic if we had not had even this capacity. And yet we yearn and ache to be together, and I believe we will soon. Plans are afoot. COVID pandemic restrictions pending that we will be able to gather on Palm Sunday and on Easter and for some services of Holy Week outside on the patio and then some combined with being inside the sanctuary. The details will follow. I need you to be paying attention because as you know, things can change quickly with this disease. But you can begin to think about joining us for worship on Palm Sunday and for some time on Easter out on the patio for worship as we give thanks for God's coming into the world, for God's promise and God's grace. Again, in the person of Jesus who gives his life on the cross to us in community, bound by God's covenant. These are the things we're focusing on in Lent, covenant, cross, and community. Not only on Sunday mornings, but also on Wednesday evenings. Wednesday evening prayer begins at 6.30, and I'm Zooming from the sanctuary to those who will uh, connect, and you are given the link on Wednesdays in a special email. The meeting number and address is the same as it's been, so you can, any of these Wednesday prayer services, you can log in. You could log in on Tuesday and wait all day until you're admitted at 6.30 if you wanted. Please come. I think uh, I know that uh, Jan uh, Newhouse and Bill uh, work so hard on the music and it really is lovely. We've heard from people who have attended that they have just been able to close their eyes and experience themselves once again in the sanctuary. There's an opportunity in real time for you to offer a prayer and for me to light a candle and, and place it in the sanctuary for your beloved and your concerns. So I hope we'll see you at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings. That's followed by a class, as we would have on a regular Lenten Wednesday time. The class is on race, society, and faith, and how those intersect together, and how we have some struggling to continue to do, and some new things to understand. That lasts about 45 minutes, so I would invite you to come. And if you don't want to, that's perfectly fine. Probably a third of the people who attended evening prayer on Zoom said goodnight, and they pushed the button, and stayed home so you can come or not come but um, we hope we get the chance to see you today in our worship there's a very special uh, addition our congregation has participated in a program called neighbors together for the last three years and the former or previous two lents our special lenten offering has gone to support uh, a woman named regat and her children they're from the country of eritrea they're asylum seekers, and uh, their whole process has been put off a year. And so we're getting an update from Jacqueline Hansen, uh, the coordinator of the program, who's a member of Christ Lutheran in Pacific Beach. And you remember, you may remember that the family has lived at Christ Lutheran in Pacific Beach on the site in the church for the last two years now. So uh, we get to hear that, and, and that's a, a blessing for us. And Susan uh, White will, will introduce uh, Jacqueline when that time comes during our worship. God's peace to you as we give thanks on this third Sunday in Lent, the midtime between the ashes and the cross, between 
the opportunity to turn ourselves over and the promise that God will embrace us and lift us up with him in resurrection. Let us worship. Please join me in the words of the Confession, Forgiveness, and Kyrie. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Keeper of the Covenant, the source of steadfast love, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour, pour out, out your, your mercy, mercy over us. us. Our, our sin is heavy, heavy and we long to be free. free. Rebuild, Rebuild what, what we have ruined, ruined and mend what, what we have torn. torn. Wash, Wash us with your cleansing flood. flood. Make, Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus. As, as healers and, and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God, your sins are forgiven. And God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Be in peace, let us pray to the Lord. together. Holy God, Holy God through, through your, your Son you have, have called us to live faithfully and to act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join Pastor Rich Ager and Deacon Marty Ager in Balboa Park today. Uh, you will hear uh, the fountain uh, overwhelming a little bit, uh, the microphone, but you can also hear them sharing God's word with us. The word for the day will be followed by a beautiful testimony from a woman named Jacqueline Hansen regarding our asylum-seeking family. Good morning. This is Rich and Margie Ager, and we are so pleased to be coming to you this morning from beautiful Balboa Park. And we have the lessons for this day that it is our privilege to read, and we invite you to hear them now at this time. The first lesson is taken from the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God, the word of life. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentile and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Remember back in 2019 at Lent, when um, we were actually together, we sponsored the family that was from Eritrea and we watched their journeys all the way over here to San Diego and got involved ourselves with trying to collect money to help with their legal fees. And you, you folks really came through and we overshot our goal just substantially. And so that money pretty well covered what they need for their for their legal needs. They still continue. And what I'd like to do now is to introduce you to Jackie Hansen, who's been involved with these folks since before we did, and she's continued on since we did. And so I hope you enjoy listening to her again. Most of you have already met her at church. This morning, I'm bringing you an update about some of the bravest women among us, Ragat and her three teenage daughters. It was two and a half years ago this weekend that they, along with Ragat's sons, then ages five and 17, arrived at Christ Lutheran Church as part of our efforts to assist immigrants so that they would not be separated at the border. Our partners in that process were Sojourn Grace Collective, PB Christian, later, 
First Lutheran Church downtown, and then San Marcos Lutheran Church. Four months later, they celebrated their first American Christmas with us. For those of you who may not remember or who perhaps never heard the story of Regat's family's background, here's a brief summary. Regat and her husband grew up in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition in here on the Horn of Africa in the country of what we would call Eritrea, but those who live there call Eritrea. It's just north of Ethiopia. It's adjacent to the Red Sea and across the Red Sea from Saudi Arabia. Eritrea has suffered, suffered under the same brutal dictator for 28 years. He's often called the Kim Jong-un of Africa. Her husband was severely beaten by government soldiers in 1998, which led Regat and her husband to decide they had to flee the country for fear of their lives. But leaving Eritrea without the dictator's permission is a serious crime meaning that they can never go back. And if they were to contact their relatives who remain there, that would put those people's lives in danger. They joined in 1998, other Eritreans fleeing the country by boat across the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia, where they remained for 20 years. As their children were born, Ragat and her husband pretended to be Muslims so that they could find jobs to support their growing family. The children went to an international school where classes were taught in Arabic, but English was part of the curriculum. The children were questioned regularly by their classmates. Are you really Muslim? You don't pray like we do. Have you made a pilgrimage to Mecca? Why not? Falsely claiming to be a Muslim in Saudi Arabia is a major crime. And by the spring of 2018, three years ago now, they were finding life there impossible. They made a plan to leave that country and come to the United States to seek asylum. Ragaz's husband, who had health problems, remained behind, but he arranged for travel documents for Ragat and the five children. In May 2018, they left Saudi Arabia, traveling north overland here to Turkey to start their journey west. From there, they flew west to Brazil, where Ragat and her daughters removed their hajibs for the final time. Just as the family started their travel northwest through South America, then into Panama through the Darien Gap, a 60 mile long rainforest bridge between South and Central America that can be traversed only on foot on a four day trek. And by the way, there are a number of very interesting documentary videos on the Darien Gap on YouTube. From southernmost Panama, Ragat's family continued north through Central America and Mexico, arriving at the U.S. port of entry in San Ysidro in late August 2018. Ragat had grown up in a culture in which girls did not attend school. So even though she understands and speaks her native Tigrinya language and some Arabic, she does not read or write any language and still is in the early stages of learning English. By contrast, all of Ragat's children arrived in the U.S. in fall 2018, fluent in their mother's indigenous language, and the four teenagers, teenagers were fluent as well in both Arabic and English. All five children were enrolled in the San Diego City Schools immediately, and all five compiled excellent academic records. Then, last March, their daily lives, like all our daily lives, were upended by COVID. Despite living in quarantine, their family has made continuous progress over the past year in adapting to American culture. 
In May 2020, as soon as they became legally eligible to do so, they all obtained U.S. work permits. In June, Ragat and the 18 and 19-year-old teenagers went through the ritual of waiting in line at the DMV to get their California real IDs. The next day, the three of them opened bank accounts. In July, all three got jobs and debit cards and arranged for direct deposits of their paychecks into their bank accounts. In late October 2020, about 10 days before they were due in San Diego Immigration Court for for the final hearing on their asylum claim, they were notified that their final court date had been pushed back to an indefinite future date due to COVID-related delays. Today, large-scale changes in immigration policies are taking place at the federal level in the United States because of the contrasting views about immigration issues between the administration that left office last month and the administration that took office. What all that will mean specifically for Ragat's family's asylum claim remains to be seen. But we know that NBC News, as of this week, reports that the U.S. immigration courts presently have a backlog of 1.3 million cases. But now, in early 2021, Ragat and the two oldest teenagers in her family are learning that most American of traditions, paying income taxes, They took in stride the fact that while the IRS 1040 form is only two pages long, the instructions with it are 111 pages long. Presently, their family is observing the Lenten season and fasting ritual of their native Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. Later this spring, The two oldest teenagers will finish their senior year of high school and hope to attend college in the fall. Over the past two and a half years, Regat and her family have become steadily more familiar with American culture, institutions, transportation systems, the workplace, and financial practices. They've learned about Halloween, birthday parties, and the 4th of July. The assistance provided to Ragat's family by the CLC community has been life-saving in helping them get a gradual foothold on American life, and they are grateful to every one of you. This year, as the pandemic eases and vaccinations become more widespread, maybe the year, the summer ahead, that will be the right time for Ragat's family to move to their own apartment and begin to live independently. Ragat, her daughters, and her sons are brave, persistent immigrants, determined to succeed and to contribute their talents to American society if allowed to remain in the United States. They've already survived not only the incredible, life-threatening challenge of a four-day trek through the Darien Gap in Panama, but on a more mundane level, they've survived their first encounters with the DMV and the IRS. They're survivors in the truest sense of the word. We can all learn from them.
The Holy Gospel for this third Sunday in the time of Lent comes to us from the second chapter of St. John. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The elders then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they said to him, Well, this temple's been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word what that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, on this day of witness, when we hear once again that the way of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, when we hear once again the invitation, even the command, to live in covenant relationship with you. As we hear once again that you come not to tinker with the world and faith, but to overturn it. God, be with us. Stretch us, fill us, make us ever mindful again of your will and way for our lives. Strengthen us when we find ourselves frightened. Give us courage when we seek to run. Help us to see your way, not just in ourselves, but in one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, my friends, my friends and family at first, what a blessing once it is again to be with you. Today, I don't have any stories as such to tell but rather a brief case to make. 
And the case is simply that we are all fools. As far as the world is concerned, you're a fool and I'm a fool. And together we are foolish. We are foolish to believe that the Son of God would die a horrible death. That the Son of God would find himself on what would be the equivalent in Rome of the lynching tree. Jesus was lynched by the mob. He was strung up, ridiculed, mocked, left to die in the desert sun. And he was surrounded at that time of death by enemies, not by friends, not by us. We weren't there. In this week of witness in our daily devotions, which have come to us from Dr. Sean Travers, we were called into the experience of feeling and recognizing that Jesus was a human being and that you and I, that we, I am a human being with a body full of emotion. And that the faith isn't something we just think about, but it's what we feel. And we see Jesus praying out his emotion, living out a real human life. It was a real human that was surrounded by enemies. We heard from Alison Emery in her marvelous devotion, a reminder from the poet Austin Channing Brown that to practice love is to disrupt the status quo, which is masquerading as peace. Masquerading as peace. Disrupt the status quo. Jesus in the gospel disrupts the status quo. He turns the tables over. It is not just a rebuke of, of a farmer's market. It's a full-on revolt, revolution, upturning, overturning of the tables of the practiced faith. You may have noted that I translated the word Jews in Scripture, which is actual because it's been so maligned and distorted and abused over the centuries by Christians, by followers of Christ who've done evil, awful things. To change that word Jews into authorities, or I should have said could have, uh, religious authorities, those in religious power, those were the pastors, the good Lutheran pastors, the good priests, Anglican priests, the good Methodist pastors, the church council, those among us who are pious, who love the church and love the rituals, who invest ourselves in the way that we practice our faith, that's all they were doing. They were just doing what they'd been taught, which was to receive a temple tax and to exchange the money so that Caesar's money wouldn't go into the temple and defile the temple. They were doing what was right to make sure that when people went into the house of God, they, had, they were clean and had the right things. But they were able to offer a sacrifice. That's all they were doing. What was this Jesus up to? He's acting like a fool. What was he disrupting? Why did he have a right to do that? And what's this nonsense about rebuilding in three days? It's foolishness. It was foolish for the established people of faith to think that things could be different, to imagine that things could be different. And it took dying. And then the witness of the resurrection for it slowly began to sink in. And St. Paul clearly says in Scripture, well, who, are, who among you are wise? <laughs> who among you are clever? Who among you have the right education to proclaim the gospel? Well, none of you do. I don't. 
and you don't. And yet we must because we have experienced the power of the resurrection. And once we experience new life and this new reality in Christ, then things change forever. What Jesus was so upset with, what, what uh, uh, sort of Jim Boyd alluded to in his devotion this week of being staying awake and staying alert is, is to watch for the inbreaking of God into the moment. The inbreaking of God into the moment. To be alert to that. And today we got to hear it, not just in the scripture read to us from Balboa Park, but the witness of, of uh, this beautiful woman and her children. And we keep a little bit wanting to protect their, their anonymity by not using their last name, by not saying all their, we hear their names, but it, we kind of keep it quiet, partly for their protection, because we know we live in a world that does not honor them, does not see them wholly as a people of God. Out in public, they will be, as they had to pass in Saudi Arabia as Muslims, they will be seen here as Muslims. And we know that there continues to be horrible prejudice. We hear this story on the very day that the Pope is still in Iraq. The world sees the Pope going to Iraq and to the Shiite Muslim cleric leader as stepping into the den of the enemy. <laughs> Hmm. But I know you and I saw blessing. We saw peace. We too saw two men of faith sharing faith and acknowledging the living God. You and I live in a different reality. You and I, in these days of Lent, know that the world that we live in is not the world that we live in. Dr. Talley, T.J. Talley, gave us a glimpse of what it means to move back and forth as, as Judas betrayed his friend, how we can condemn him but then recognize that we also betray Jesus. We move back and forth between uh, the way of the world, which is flat, this two-dimensional reality, which is all just about power and greed and power and greed of jealousy and anger, of retribution, of I must win, to the way of Jesus, which is the way of the cross, which is foolishness, which makes no sense. This invitation to give our lives wholly, not just a piece of our life, not just an offering, but our whole lives. To bear the cross of Christ alongside him. We like to think that when Jesus says, well, take up your cross and follow me, that he meant some little one, the little one like we wear on our neck, right? Or the little pocket cross. Well, no, the cross that Christ gives is, is as big as his. And for many, it leads to the same place. For many, it leads to the same place, to Golgotha. And then we end yesterday, yesterday's devotion by Matt Eckert. Being left alone, being left betrayed, wondering if was I a fool or not? I, I thought and I heard so differently from Christ, this Jesus that was going to change the world. And the world doesn't seem to have changed. Why am I alone? I thought taking out my sword was what he wanted. Was I so wrong? As Frank DeLuise put it, was I so pressed? Have I been so shaken down and compressed and oppressed and repressed that the spirit can't get out anymore? Or maybe in that pressing, something new comes. Something more refined comes. Today, 
as we are, find ourselves shaped by the commandments, shaped by the will and the law of God in relationship to God, as we find ourselves with the witness of our Lord who turns the tables over, offering a new path and a new way, not a transactional relationship with God, but a grace-initiated relationship. We find ourselves proclaiming what is foolish to the world. I'm condemned. I'm condemned and I'm saved. That's foolishness to believe that that could be true. But it is. May it be so with you. May your life also know, your flesh know, your mind know that you don't have a place. <laughs> Not in this world. But that because of the cross, you are named and claimed. You are adopted by the living God to live forever in his kingdom, with him in glory. This is the Lenten promise. This is the covenant truth. This is the reality of the cross and the gift of community with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me now in the prayers of intercession. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air, water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and the skies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislatures, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and the freedom of all. Especially this day for all people of color, for all those outside traditional systems of power. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and to our church leaders 
so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel. It serves our own interests. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. But what else do the people of God pray? remember all those families who are suffering this day. And we give thanks also for the miracle of science and medicine and all those in these days who are being vaccinated and the promise that that brings of opportunity to be together. Help us to be thankful for what we have instead of complaining for what we don't. Help us yearn for justice. Seek your wrath, your way. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. And now we know that the cross of Christ is your power for all being saved. Thank you for all the more martyrs and witnesses to the faith who reveal the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Share together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. give thanks at this time for our God who gives his only son that we might live giving us in turn the opportunity to give from our own lives that others like Regat and her children might live that justice might have its way in the world through us shall we pray God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit 
be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you have taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and, and the glory are yours, yours now and, and forever. forever. Amen. My soul cries out. Let us sing. Let the fires of your justice burn. For the world is about to turn. receive the blessing and benediction as we go, as we stay. Go now, be with God's foolishness and weakness as your only wisdom and strength. Proclaim Christ crucified and seek riches only in the love of God's word and in zeal for God's house. May God's just demands be your nourishment and delight. May Christ be the power and the wisdom of God to you. May the Holy Spirit keep you, thought, word, and in God's good grace. Let us go in peace and share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.